Please welcome Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Dean of the University of Minnesota Medical School, Dr. Jacob Tolar. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Tolar. I am, unless you were wondering, not one of the famous people who have spoken with you earlier today and yesterday. I am a bone marrow transplant physician. I treat people with cancer and uh, genetic disorders. I run a team of people who have uh, been studying genomic engineering. This is how we know that genes are operating, how they regulate our lives and our cells. Study stem cells as well. Part of them are in the bone marrow transplant business. And in the leadership roles, I serve as a dean of medical school and uh, vice president for academic clinical affairs at the University of Minnesota. Now, university, academia, is a wonderful place. It's a huge place. There are 51,000 students in the Twin Cities campus alone, and about 6,000 are in what we call health sciences or health schools. So it's like dentistry, medical school, nursing, pharmacy, vet medicine, school of public health. And uh, if you live in this state, very good chance is that your physician, your health providers are from the University of Minnesota because we provide about 70% of doctors and nurses and pharmacists for the, for the whole state. And we take this extremely seriously. And we have done this for a long time. The medical school is 136 years old. The dental school about 131, 110 for the nursing school. So the challenge for us is what are we gonna do differently? than we have done before, and how, in the, in the scope of things, how medicine has changed and health fields have changed over even the last couple decades, it is not as prominent as how you have changed, because you have watched Grey's Anatomy and ER and uh, Scrubs, and you know what STAT means, and you know what sphingo manometer means, and uh, you wanna know what is it that happens with, uh, with, with your health. So all these fields are circling around you as a patient, your family, your community. And the question is, how will we deliver for you providers that match that expectation? I have a, in my office, I have a bag from uh, one of, our graduates uh, from 1930s. So that's the country doctor, Ford, Model T, right? Goes from the house calls, gets paid in chicken and eggs, pigs, and uh, great people, compassionate and everything. But one flip, one look at your smartwatch today, right now, will give you more information than he, typically he at that time, would have given you for the whole, whole visit. And now what happens is that one third of you, when you have a problem, when you have a something's not right here, something's not right here, didn't sleep well, you go on the web and uh, find the diagnosis there. So that's where you go first. You do not wait for that country doctor to give you a pill from that bag and, or a mustard plaster, and you, know, you, you do it on your own. And uh, 74 million hits go on the WebMD alone every month. So this is an incredible change in how we look at what medicine can provide. So what I'm thinking about is that we have we need to disrupt the environment in which we have provided education for our health professionals so that we look not just outside of the box, but we look with no box at all. Because that is 
how the healthcare, as you have listened to all of the speakers so far, how is the business model in this country, at least, has failed you as customers, you as patients, you as people, um, because it's a business. It's a, it's a business that's built around me as a surgeon, as a bone marrow transplant, or my nurses, about, around my billing, about the insurance company that comes. It's not built around you. And that, that's why when you make a call to, you know, to get answers, you hear 10 minutes of Schubert, and then somebody picks up, right? gets you somewhere where you didn't want to be in the first place, and then finally somebody is going to give you an appointment in seven weeks. That's ridiculous. You know, that's, that, that's, that's never going to really work. And you feel like Don Quixote here, uh, you know, looking for, for the answers. So the alternative, the very viable, the very positive, the very real alternative to all of this is that we get all these people around you. So you can easily imagine that you have first an epidemiologist that comes, you know, then you know, somebody will you know, check your teeth. It's a part of your body. Then somebody's gonna use this phygnomanometer, check your blood pressure. A pharmacist is gonna come and fill in the prescription. The nurse is gonna show up and uh, talk to you, right? That's how it's supposed to be. And then the nurse leaves, and on the way out, you pet your cat, like that, right? And it decreases your blood pressure. Clinically proven, if you have cats, I do too. <laughs> stretch, I know. But this is not a stretch. This is a building, it's called Health Science Education Building that we're gonna open in several months at the university campus, and that is, built around this concept of training people in very, very different ways. This is how we bring these teams together, how we realize that nobody is smart enough to match what you need to have at this day and age, you know, in, in, in healthcare and, and education. And that is built around the notion that the teams are always better than the individuals, that too, but also around Two floors of this are what we call simulation. So it is medicine, in contrast to some other fields perhaps, is a show and tell. You actually have to see somebody do this well before you do this well. You have to have role models that you have, you have somehow seen what they do. You have read the textbooks, you watched the videos, you, you did all that stuff, you memorized it. But it's not enough. You actually have to see it in action. And one more thing that you have to do is, that I have seen many times, you have to train yourself almost as an athlete. You know, when, you know, at five o'clock this morning I do the power cleans in my CrossFit gym, this is no different. Because if you have a call on Friday night, you have five teenagers in a car accident, two are dead, three are almost dead, you freeze. Most people will not handle this just right. If you have somebody on the operating table that's bleeding out, people don't typically react in the first time optimally. Somebody stops breathing in your clinic, that is something that does not come naturally to anyone to actually handle. So that's why we have these simulation floors. That's why we look at this and say, you know, this is a, a training. You know, it's, it's exactly the same setting as you will encounter in your, in your practice, but it happens to be something that you can actually train yourself to do before you get to that position. So we have changed the way we educate people. We, we don't take the expertise as equivalent of excellence. Expertise it's not equivalent to excellence. Excellence is something that you can combine all of these things together and you will, we all have seen it, excellence in any, any, any walk of life, where you can deliver something that, is, that has all the texts and all the facts and all the data, but it also has these imponderables that you put it together, that you do what an artificial intelligence, as much as I admire this, cannot do 
to have a common sense and a pattern recognition that is outside of the, of the machine learning itself. It's also a deference in a way to how young medicine as a science is. I, for my own heuristic, you know, use the birthday of George Washington. Anyone? I'm not American, I am, you know. No, no, 1732, okay. So that's where I think, you know, the, the medicine stopped being magic and started being medicine. It started with physics and mathematics, then chemistry, then biology on the turn of the 19th and 20th century. But that's how it travels. It's a very young science. And the accomplishments are incredible. The accomplishments just on this university, I can say pacemaker. You know, the rhythm. If you lose the rhythm, you know, in your heart, you don't last very long. So the first pacemaker was made here. We have similar pacemakers that are now being made for people with Parkinson's disease. These are pacemakers for the brain. You put a, you know, this pen-sized thing, you know, very thin wire into the bottom of the, of, the, of the brain, and you can have change someone from being locked in in a helpless, almost hopeless position of limited movement, limited expression, limited language to somebody who is as, you know, as, as uh, functional as you are. Closer to my field, what we call chimeric antigen receptors are a scientific heroism almost, you know, where we take cells, stem cells sometimes, sometimes immune cells, and we arm them with the zip codes that don't exist in nature. We will match them to the specific cancer of a specific patient, and without chemotherapy and radiation, we can deliver them, and they take that cancer out. That is life-changing. That is what medicine is supposed to do. But in the current environment, it's difficult to grasp that patients, especially those that are, that are very sick, are like refugees. They need to be treated kindly and gravely, and in contrast to you and me, I assume they have been given a view of a painful evidence of their own mortality. So if you are in the category of people who think that essential access to healthcare is a fundamental human right that society has responsibility for parts of these, this equation, then you can visit what we call Cook. Cook is the Community University Health Center. You know, this is in uh, downtown Minneapolis. It serves immigrant population, about 80%. It, um, low income. But the interprofessional education that I mentioned at the beginning, that's all there. You have a nurse, you have a mental health specialist, you have somebody who specializes in dentistry, you have an internist, uh, and you, you know, which is, which is beautiful, you have a legal office. We have a pro bono legal advice in the same, same, uh, same office. So most of these people, English is a second language for them. So hey, English is my second or third language. That alone, you know, should not disqualify anyone. And uh, the, the, the burdens, you know, on uh, some of that societal extension of healthcare that our trainees, our professionals, our doctors are getting from there are in the category of the wicked problems. Academia is a best platform in the society for ambivalence. We actually teach people by not polarizing them in a political or on a spectrum. We tell them that this is what's ambivalence. We ask them to hold contrarian views in their mind and to have a disciplined, sophisticated, data-based discourse about these alternatives. So if you have a wicked problem, problem that cannot be solved by a linear uh, exposure, linear application, you better have people that are trained in this fashion. This includes homelessness, this includes uh, activation you know, of other part of the university, which is a college of design, and it included recently uh, the opioid epidemic. And the opioid epidemic is a part of the mental health spectrum, which I would argue is one of the most likely crises of upcoming several decades. If you look at where the 
mental health today is. Uh, about 40% of these 51,000 students on the Twin Cities campus as undergraduates come with a diagnosis of some mental health disturbance. The reason why, which is almost unimaginable, the CDC reports that the three years in a row, the life expectancy of an average American is going down, not up, but down, uh, for the first time since 1915. 1915 is where, that was the World War I, right? Flu epidemic, Spanish flu, uh, a little later than 1915. But, you know, you get my, no antibiotics, you know, no really pain control, no surgery, none of that stuff that I mentioned about pacemakers and deep brain stimulation or chimeric antigen or something, none of that existed. And yet, the reason why the expectancy is going down is uh, depression, addiction, suicide, Addiction is a sort of a slow suicide anyway. And uh, that's why I think you know, we will have to access, we should access all the layers in engagement of our providers, of your providers, my students and trainees, in all the layers of the university. And the way to do this is to do what makes the most sense, which is put them in teams, as I told you, but also expose them to the humanities. And, and it's not like, you know, it's a, you know, history of, you know, Britain is that important. No, it's the sensibilities that come from art that are irreplaceable, I think, by science alone. And it can be an architecture like, you know, Frank Gehry, or it can be Andrea Palladio on the University Mall. It can be when, it's like a pharmacy. You pick up a book or listen to a music that matches that particular state of your mind. So you can look at these uh, exquisite buildings, you know, at the time that you are, you know, I'm gonna do this, you know, I'm after that. And then at other times you sort of blast and, and, and vulnerable, and then you look at Sunday Morning by Edward Hopper, or you listen to Sempre Libera by uh, Maria Callas, and, uh, that's where I think the resources of the university come, and that's where we can unite it into a, uh, a loop that looks at the sciences and arts as a means of understanding. That's how we understand the world around us, our life, our history, our presence. That also increases humanity in our students and, and people that we send out. But as you have heard, you know, these couple of days, and anybody who has eyes, you know, will see, the healthcare in the United States is a failed model. It is not gonna work. It's not gonna work because you cannot hire more people, you cannot pay more for this. It has to be fixed as a wicked problem by an oblique way. And that oblique way will get us from the healthcare that now, in my opinion, has a pattern of this exuberant mediocrity. Exuberant in a way that I can list and list and go after one another, these brilliant, you know, ad, you know, uh, advances in medicine. But when you are sick, you're gonna, chances are, be confused and lonely and angry at times. This is not what a simple, safe and health-oriented system should be. This is not, you know, what we are after. This has to be changed into this interprofessional training, patient-focused care and uh, domesticated innovation. Innovation that has a clear goal. And out of all of that, the university and everything that it represents can provide engaged trainees and providers that as a combination of all of these layers and aspects of the academic life will take these virtues and with the discipline of business will make them profitable. Good? Okay. So it's a time for new resolve. It's time to write a new chapter. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone.